Welcome to the workshop, Breath of Life, Your Lungs After Transplant. My name is Sue Stewart and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Jane Turner. Dr. Turner is an assistant professor in the, in the Division of Respirology at McMaster University in Canada and a pulmonologist at Jurabinsky Cancer Center. She studied with leading experts on pulmonary problems after transplant at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and she recently founded a specialized clinic within the Jurabinsky Cancer Center to provide accessible and specialized care to stem cell transplant patients with respiratory concerns. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Turner. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm calling in from Hamilton, Ontario, as Sue mentioned, uh, from McMaster University. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest to declare. I have a little bit of research on the go, which is um, supported by my academic center. Um, that is my email on the slide there. If you have any questions after the presentation, uh, then please feel free to reach out. So I would like to review some of the respir respiratory or pulmonary issues that we run into after the stem cell transplant process. Um, I was going to start with some basic respiratory anatomy function and review, uh, mostly because I know we're all coming into this talk today with different backgrounds and different knowledge bases. Um, I think understanding some of that function can put things into context. From there, we'll talk about some of the different types of pulmonary dysfunction after transplant, who might be at risk, and how we're currently approaching management. Um, so the components of the respiratory system, how do we breathe? So the most important well, one of the most important components are the airways. So if you feel right between your, your two heads of your clavicle and you poke and you feel a bit of discomfort in your neck, that's your windpipe or your trachea. And that's our biggest airway that leads down into our chest. From there, it divides into smaller and smaller branches, like a tree. And as those airways get smaller, they take on different terminologies or names. So the very smallest airways we have are called bronchioles, and they're about a millimeter in diameter. Those bronchioles then turn into these air sacs, um, which is almost like a sponge. And those are the gas exchanging units of the lung. So the air travels all the way down your airways into those smaller and smaller airways until it hits those little air sacs. Each of those air sacs is surrounded by a very small blood vessel or a network of blood vessels. And those blood vessels pick up the oxygen from the air and then eventually lead it back into your heart. So the lung tissue after we get past the airways, the lung tissue is that network of spongy airways and blood vessels. Other components, uh, which are very important, are the muscles. So the major musculature system of our respiratory anatomy is the diaphragm. It's a big dome-shaped muscle that lies right underneath our lungs. And as it contracts, it allows our lungs to expand and to, and to breathe in air. Other muscles include muscles in between our ribs, as well as those in our neck, which we use more so when we're in distress and we need extra help with, uh, with, with exertional breathing. These are all very important components, and they all work together to enable us to, to breathe and to exchange oxygen within our body. In terms of what can be affected in the, in the post-stem cell transplant population, any of these segments of our pulmonary system can be affected post-transplant. So your airways, your blood vessels, your lung tissue itself, that spongy tissue that um, mixes in with the blood vessels, uh, the muscles, uh, as well as whatever is surrounding the lung. So the lungs sit in our chest, and they're surrounded by some soft tissue and by our chest wall. So anything that tightens up that, that tissue or that chest wall will also impede how our lungs work and their ability to, to inhale and to exhale. Um, in terms of the spectrum of these, all these complications, so as I mentioned, they can affect almost any part of our breathing system or our pulmonary system. When you group them all together, uh, the incidence is about 20% um, of all comers post stem cell transplant. Now, this is post 100 days. So the, in the first 100 days after your transplant, the majority of, of pulmonary complications we see are infectious. So while those, those cells are engrafting, while their immune system gets, gets back up to, to speed, although admittedly it takes much longer than 100 days for that to happen. But after that 100-day mark, we see a shift in that pulmonary problems become less infectious and more non-infectious in nature. 
So, so the 100-day mark is called a late onset non-infectious pulmonary complication. And we see some kind of lung problem in about 20% of patients, uh, which we fit in this category. It's important uh, because breathing is life. Uh, so any problem with your, with your breathing not only impedes how you live your life, but it also leads to many hospitalizations. Uh, unfortunately, is also a leading cause of death uh, in the, in the non-relapse uh, category of, of stem cell transplant. Um, So in terms of lung disease, the most common thing you'll hear about, especially um, in this group today, is, is GVHD-associated lung disease. So the only entity that's, that's defined as GVHD at current is something called BOS, which is bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. And we will talk more about that shortly. Um, that's an airway problem. So as I mentioned, the pulmonary system um, the first thing we think about is the airways. The bronchioles are the smallest airway in that system. So with bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, or BOS, those airways become destroyed. They become obliterated. And it's called an obstructive process. That is simply a term we use when looking at pulmonary function tests, or the breathing test that you will receive as part of your screening after your transplant. If you imagine breathing through a straw, a straw is your airway, Imagine what happens if that straw's diameter gets cut by half, or if someone stands on that straw and occludes it par partly. It's much more difficult to breathe out, and that's what happens when your airways start becoming destroyed. That ability to take that nice, forceful breath out is much more difficult. BOS is the only um, pathology that's definitively part of the GVHD definition. There are other things that we think are probably related to GVHD. We think the pathology of GVHD probably triggers a process uh, which, which leads to pulmonary problems, but they haven't actually been included in the definition. There's several of these entities, but the one that you're most likely to have heard about or to come across is something called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And the short form for that is COP. And the reason I bring that up specifically is because it often gets confused with BOS because of their three-letter acronyms. But they're quite different in terms of diagnosis and pathology. So COP, or any sort of um, interstitial lung disease, is when that actual air sac, or that spongy lung tissue, that gets filled with inflammatory fibrous uh, material. So it should be filled with air. In things like COP, it becomes filled with a substance that's not air. And that limits our lungs from moving. So not only is there no gas exchange in that area, but your lungs actually become a little bit smaller looking because it's no longer filled with air. It's filled with something else. So we call that a restrictive pattern. And that's one of the first differences in terms of categories we place lung problems into, whether it's an airway problem like BOS, which is obstructive, or a lung tissue problem like COP, which is restrictive. Then we come to what I call collateral damage. So after transplant, um, as many of you will know, you're very deconditioned. Uh, you're often on prednisone or other immunosuppressants, and it can affect everything that supports your lung. So when I say support, I mostly mean the muscles. So being on prednisone can cause you to be quite weak. Being in hospital for long periods of time with any transplant complications can lead you to be quite weak. And all of those muscles supporting the lung need strength to help you breathe properly. So as soon as you start losing your, your conditioning and your strength, uh, your lungs will be affected. Uh, similarly, in terms of things that surround the lung, if your chest wall is affected in any way, um, your, your lungs sit inside your chest. And you need that nice, flexible skin, a nice, flexible thoracic cage for your lungs to breathe in and out, almost like an accordion, effectively. So one of the more common uh, GVHD manifestations, which is skin GVHD, if you have that sclerotic phenotype or that, that tightening of the skin that can sometimes come with skin GVHD, that limits how much your lungs can move inside your chest. It's like having a tight rubber band around your chest. So that can also lead to pulmonary problems that aren't specifically involving the lung tissue, uh, but just things that are supporting or outside of the lungs. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit more about bronchiolitis because I think that's one of the more uh, common things that we see. Bronchiolitis is simply a, a defining term. So as I mentioned, the smallest areas that we have are called the bronchioles. Litis, so I-T-I-S, means inflammation of something. So bronchiolitis means inflammation of those very small airways. It's not specific to, to the stem cell transplant group. A lot of different things could cause bronchiolitis. So rheumatoid arthritis or certain toxic gases or chemicals can lead to a similar pathology or a similar disease. But we, 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 we call it or we label it something else when we see it in the transplant population. So this is just a closer look. Again, our airways branch into smaller and smaller branches. At the very end, the very terminal branch you see there, it's respiratory bronchioles. Um, there's no cartilage in their airway, uh, as opposed to some of the bigger ones. And they're mostly supported by smooth muscle. They tend to be about one millimeter or less in diameter. This is a, a graphic to, to show what happens in the obliterative bronchiolitis process. Um, so on the left, you have a normal bronchial. You see a nice patent lumen, uh, similar to a straw. And on the right, you can see that these inflammatory cells and smooth muscle is hypertrophying or increasing in size, and it's slowly obliterating or destroying that lumen. So that nice patent straw that we like to breathe through is all of a sudden occluded by inflammatory cells and smooth muscle. This is how it looks under a microscope. So on the left, again, you have that nice clear lumen. On the right, you can see that the lumen has become thickened. It's now full of that pink material, which represents airway wall, inflammatory cells, and smooth muscle. So it's a clinical correlate, or what happens to you as a human being when this starts happening, is that you get progressive airflow obstruction, meaning that it's very much hard, it's, it's much harder to breathe out. Um, and over time, that leads to breathlessness. Uh, sometimes a dry cough can be the first symptom, and ultimately it affects how, how air can get into your lungs and your ability to effectively breathe and exchange oxygen. In terms of how this might happen, specifically BOS in the, in the GVHD spectrum, uh, it's still being defined. There are various hypotheses out there. It's thought that some initial inflammatory insult probably sets off a cascade. So whether it be a viral infection, which has been linked to a higher incidence of BOS, whether it be um, a toxin, so in, in, in the stem cell transplant group, it's, it's usually a conditioning regimen or, or possibly radiation uh, that's thought to just um, initiate some inflammatory injury. Uh, and sometimes, too, it can be something as simple as reflux or heartburn, uh, which we don't even realize, but some of that those micro droplets of acidic fluid end up in our lung if we have bad reflux or bad heartburn. So that acute inflammation can subsequently and ultimately lead to chronic inflammation, uh, which then sets off a cascade of, of chemical signal, signaling uh, molecules in the body called cytokines and leads to this dysregulated process, which eventually um, leads to fibrosis. Um, this is, a, again, just to remind us that BOS is an airway issue. So through this graphic, you can see an airway coursing through spongy tissue. It's the very smallest bit of that airway that's getting obliterated, and it doesn't actually affect the, the, the lung tissue or the, the gas-exchanging bubbles themselves. So just a little bit of uh, background on BOS. The highest, the most definitive risk factor we know is GVHD in other organs. And that's why you know, it came to our attention that this is probably part of the GVHD spectrum and that most of the time we see it in people who have already established extrapulmonary or non-lung GVHD. Uh, in, that, in that higher risk population, the incidence is about 14%. You can see it in isolation. It's not always with GVHD. And the incidence or the, the, the chance of it happening over a population level and that group is more along the lines of 5%. We, we tend to um, uh, see it diagnosed within the first six months, sorry, within six months to, to about two years after transplant. Uh, sometimes it can be as early as three months. Very rarely is it ever before three months. Um, a lot of the literature suggests about two years 
out is when we start to, to see it a bit less. But it really can, the more, we, the, the more we learn about it, the more we realize we're actually seeing this entity up to five years, sometimes even 10 years post-transplant. So it is something that, that can creep up even in the, in the late post-transplant years. In terms of how we diagnose it, uh, we rely on pulmonary function tests. So those are those big uh, breathing tests that we, that we use to screen post-transplant. A CT scan is often used. We look for specific things, which I'll run through briefly. Uh, and sometimes just to exclude other things such as infection or making sure that nothing else is confounding our diagnosis, things like a bronchoscopy or a biopsy is required. Um, as I mentioned, the biggest risk factor, the most defined risk factor we know is GVHC in other organs. There are certain things that we think may contribute. So if you had pre-transplant lung problems, so if you had COPD or frequent pneumonias or some kind of lung issue, you may be at a higher risk. Um, myeloablative uh, conditioning regimens are thought to be a higher inflammatory insult, so probably a risk factor for, for BOS. Um, any radiation for previous cancer treatments, especially in the chest. Um, and the viral infections are a big one. So there is more and more evidence to suggest that after transplant, viral infections may set you up for that inflammatory cascade, which can eventually lead to BOS. Uh, just in case anyone uh, is not familiar, this is a PFT. So you sit in the body box and it measures how easily you can breathe in and breathe out air. What do we measure? I think this is important to run through because often we talk about these numbers and don't really explain what they mean. Uh, so SEV1 is one of the um, biggest markers or most important markers that we use to actually track your lung function. What we're actually measuring here is the amount of air you can breathe out in the first second of a forced exhalation. So a deep breath in and then a big blow out. And in that first second, there's a volume of air that's exhaled. And that's what we call the SEV1. It's a measure of airflow. So the less resistance to airflow you have in your lungs, the more air you'll be able to get out. Similar to that straw analogy. If you blow out of a straw that's nice and big, you can blow a lot out. If it's very small, it's harder to blow out a meaningful amount of air through that straw. So as the airways are obliterated or destroyed, even the very small airways at the very end of our airway highway, that airflow becomes more difficult to blow out when your SEV1 will decline or drop with time. SVC is another measurement that we follow over time. Um, and what the, it's called the forced vital capacity. And when you take that nice deep breath in and that forced exhale out, the first second of that exhale is the SEV1. And then the volume of the entire exhale is the SVC. So it's how much air you can breathe out from start to finish of that nice big forced exhalation. And that's an important measurement because it helps us know how much air you can actually hold in your lungs and that you actually expire out. So something like a restrictive process, like COP, which I mentioned earlier, which takes up airspace by inflammatory goop, you can no longer have air in that space. So when you try to fill up your lungs with air, you'll have that much less air to blow out. So when we start seeing a drop in SVC, we call it a restrictive pattern, and we start thinking about lung tissue problems or something that's restricting our lung tissue. And then uh, finally, um, the DLCO. Um, so this is a measure of gas diffusion. So when we take a deep breath in, uh, the air comes through our airways and ends up in those small air sacs or that spongy kind of tissue that I mentioned, which is surrounded by capillaries, which are small blood vessels. The oxygen has to be able to diffuse from your air sac into that blood vessel. Um, if it can't diffuse into the blood vessel, then our body has no way of picking up that oxygen from the air that we're breathing in. So the DLCO measures how well our body is picking up that oxygen into our blood from the air. So how efficient is that interface? If you start having a fibrotic process, if you start having scarring of your lung tissue, of that spongy tissue, then it's more difficult for the gas to get through. Um, and it's, it's, it's more difficult for a body to pick up the oxygen that we need from the air into our blood and then to send it around to our body. This is the, the value that we most often see a change in post-transplant. 
a lot of the times we'll get referrals just because um, what we call a non-specific decline in DLCO. So this number drops, you know, in the first year post-transplant, and it often drops and then stabilizes. And it often, you know, we do a CAT scan and we look for pathology and we can't find anything. Um, and it, some studies show that up to in about five years' time, some of those numbers will start normalizing again. It's not clear why this efficiency of gas transfer can drop in the transplant setting, uh, but it's thought to be probably that some of the conditioning regimens and the radiation um, and the sort of cytotoxic treatment that people receive um, causes sort of microscopic damage to those tiny little air sacs and those tiny little vessels and impedes that ability of gas exchange, even though we can't see it on a CAT scan. This is an example of a graph that we might see uh, when we're looking at your lung function tests. Uh, so this red line here with that scooping, that's what we see um, when it's graphed out in terms of an obstructive pattern, and that's typical for BOS. Uh, in terms of how we diagnose BOS, so technically you actually need a, a, a good chunk of lung, which requires a, a surgery and often an ICU stay. So it's not practical to obtain in, in most patients. So we rely on other criteria, sort of softer markers, to signal to us maybe there's, there's airway pathology happening in the lungs. And, and the most commonly used um, system we use is that of screening pulmonary function tests, as well as CT scan findings. So to avoid having to do lung biopsies in any patient that we suspect may have some airway problems or BOS, the National Institutes of Health created what's called consensus criteria. So this is criteria based on a bunch of people who are sitting in a room and decide that, you know, this pathology tends to present like this in, in this way with obstructive airway disease. So we are going to uh, provide these criteria to diagnose it, even though technically you still do need the biopsy. Um, so you need airflow obstruction so that FEV1 value that I mentioned will drop. It needs to have dropped over the last two years in some measurable way. We have to rule out other confounding things, which is where things like bronchoscopy come in to make sure there's no infection. Uh, and we also look for supporting features, so something else to signal that, yes, this is a small airways process and not something else that drops the FEV1, because a variety of problems uh, can, can actually affect your FEV1. Um, so some of you may be familiar with these, with these steps. Um, in terms of the, the CAT scan that we look at, um, this is a, a CAT scan of the chest. Uh, as you can see, there's little white spots speckled throughout. That's normal. Those are just blood vessels. And normal airways or normal lung tissue on a CAT scan looks black. So you'll see around the periphery, um, there's, it's more black than it is around the center. That's, that inconsistency in, in blackness or in grayness is actually abnormal. You should just see it all one color. And the reason that it's um, patchy like this is because as those small airways get destroyed, you can't take a nice, good, deep breath out. Some of that air gets trapped because those small airways are being destroyed. So you can't blow out all of your air. And because some of the airways are okay and some of them aren't, it leaves us with this patchy sort of appearance on CAT scan. And that's what we're looking for in terms of you know, supporting criteria when we start seeing lung function changes. You may also see some dilated airways. So eventually, uh, although it starts in your small airway, the pathology can become, can kind of creep up the airway and start affecting your larger airways. So on the right-hand side, you might see some sort of cystic nodular um, lucencies or holes in this CAT scan, and those are just dilated airways as the pathology is progressing up the, up the airway to become more proximal. Um, so in terms of monitoring your lung function post-transplant, it's actually very common to have a little bit of lung function fluctuation after your transplant. Uh, Anne Bergeron in Paris does a lot of uh, work with, uh, with, with BOS and, and pulmonary GBHD. And she demonstrated prospectively that up to 80% of people after their transplant will have some dips in FEV1. Now, most of the time, these aren't sustained, meaning some of the time it's just because you're feeling a bit weak from your hospital admission. Uh, you don't 
you know, blow as hard that day. Um, it's only a sustained decrease that makes us worry. So it's often alarming for people to have that drop in their SUV1, um, but it's not always thought. It's just a signal for us to watch you a little bit closer. As I mentioned, there's many events following a transplant that can lead your lung function to, to dip a little bit. If you have an infection, if you're deconditioned, uh, sometimes the conditioning regimen can be very toxic and it can affect your lung uh, in ways that takes a few years to recover from. And then as I mentioned, any other GVHD that's around your lungs, so skin GVHD or, or muscle weakness from parts of your treatment, uh, that can also affect how your lung functions and, and how your lungs look on that pulmonary function test. In terms of how often we like to monitor lungs for GVHD, we tend to recommend every three months screening for at least the first one year. If you've had a very easy or uneventful post-transplant course, and by that I mean you no know, acute GVHD, you no know, chronic GVHD, everything, you know, you come off of all your immunodepressants, you might be able to do a little bit less than that. Um, in the high-risk population, so anyone who has bad GVHD elsewhere, who we think you know is, is at risk, then we would likely opt to extend that pulmonary screening at least to two years and sometimes longer. Not only do we have to do screening, which basically means performing lung function tests when you're well, but we also tend to repeat them if there's any sign of inflammatory bursts elsewhere. So if you're having a GVHD flare, if you're having a respiratory tract infection, then we'll probably get an intercurrent or a breakthrough screen just to make sure your lung function is holding steady and it's not getting caught up in that inflammatory process. Uh, this is a graphic demonstrating the same thing, uh, just in terms of how often we like to keep an eye on your lung function. So um, one of the most common things we get asked in the office is what's the prognosis of lung GVHD. Uh, a lot of the literature um, suggests that your risk of death is almost doubled by a diagnosis of GVHD of the lung. Um, some of that data is a little bit older, and what we're seeing now is a bit more optimistic in terms of a lot of patients actually get lung GVHD, which stabilizes with time. Um, and doesn't progress any further. And you can actually live a long time uh, with GVHD of the lung, and, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't progress any further. Um, what um, Dr. Cheng found in Seattle uh, with her population that she studied is that there seems to be a somewhat predictable pattern in terms of there's this, if you can, the red line there is, is the point at which BOS is diagnosed, and it's preceded by um, a drop in lung function. So the blue line is your FEV1. So there seems to be this sudden drop of lung function, um, and then it stabilizes. And, and we don't know if that's a treatment effect, or we don't know if that's just the natural history of BOS, and that's just how it behaves. But it does suggest, especially with these really sharp declines in lung function, that in those patients, in that population, that perhaps there was an inciting event, whether it be a GVHD flare, whether it be a respiratory virus, when we see that really quick drop before um, a BOS diagnosis is made, then we start thinking, you know, was there something else contributing to this onset of, of, airway, of airway pathology? In terms of how we manage BOS, um, maybe familiar with SAM, uh, it's actually SAM plus lab -S. These are This is a, a treatment regimen based on trials um, performed over the last decade or so as well as some experience we have with bronchiolitis in other populations. So uh, standard of, of management tends to be a, a puffer or inhaler, which has a steroid in it. So that's fluticasone, or budesonide, the different names for steroids. A long-acting beta agonist, so what that is, it's a, it's a bronchodilator, meaning it's, um, you inhale, it's a puffer that you inhale, and it activates uh, receptors on your smooth muscle to keep that smooth muscle open. So it helps open up those airways and relieve some of that obstruction that's causing you to be short of breath. Azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, which is thought to have anti-inflammatory effects. And then Montelukast, which is a, um, a technically an allergy medication, but again is thought to have some anti-inflammatory and immune-modulating effects. 
In terms of what we hope to gain from starting this uh, regimen, there's possible stabilization of SEV1. Again, it's not clear whether some of that stabilization is simply the way that BOS behaves naturally, just simply the natural history of the disease itself. Um, but, but what we do know uh, with a bit more certainty is that in studies it has demonstrated it allows us to reduce the amount of prednisone you're taking. So it means that we can, over time, over population level, uh, with FAM therapy, we saw a reduction in how much chronic prednisone and cumulative prednisone people were receiving. And coming off prednisone is always a good thing. Um, you may have seen uh, various inhaled uh, corticosteroid or inhaler combinations um, uh, prescribed. So the most common ones you'll probably see are Simbicort, Adbear, uh, Brio, Dulera, I don't use, but uh, you may be familiar with it. Um, and then some of the long-acting um, puffers you might see are, are these names on the right here. In terms of systemic corticosteroids, so as many of you will know, this is a mainstay for other forms of GVHD, so skin GVHD, gut GVHD. Uh, but for, for lung GVHD, it's actually thought to be a little bit different in that it's, it's not terribly responsive to oral steroids. There's no compelling evidence to suggest that a long course of oral steroids really changes the disease at all. So while we do usually give a short burst, usually around 50 milligrams for two weeks at the onset of, of FEV1 change or BOS onset, there's no evidence to suggest that a prolonged long taper of prednisone is uh, beneficial for, for a BOS diagnosis. We always try to reduce any exacerbating inflammatory insults, so things like infections. You know, in the time of COVID, everyone's very familiar um, with, you know, hand washing and uh, uh, being, being careful of, of your mouth coverings. But that's, that's that standard course for the stem cell transplant group in terms of just being very clean and careful, um, making sure that any sinus disease, any reflux, any environmental exposures that might be dangerous, so occupational exposures to work, uh, are all controlled, just to minimize that inflammatory uh, insult to the lung, which, which can possibly cause the cascade, which ultimately leads to that, that pathology of BOS. Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about azithromycin. Uh, as some of you may be aware, there's a, a study published out of Paris in 2017 uh, for um, uh, using azithromycin as prophylaxis. So prophylaxis means uh, you take it to avoid getting BOS. So right after their transplant was completed, a group of patients took azithromycin to see if maybe BOS would be prevented through this, through this medication. An unexpected outcome was that there was quite a, there was a signal uh, that there was an increased risk of relapse with azithromycin. So that uh, was not expected at the time of the study um, creation. It resulted in early termination of the study, and it also led us uh, to think a bit more carefully in terms of when we prescribe azithromycin. Uh, I think it's important to know that this trial was looking at azithromycin prophylactically, so very early after transplant, and how we tend to use it as pulmonologists is once that BOS diagnosis has been made. So there's a fair bit of difference between a prophylactic treatment versus a treatment that you start once a diagnosis has been made, just in terms of timing. So we tend to, to not use azithromycin until at least six months to a year post-transplant, just by the nature of when BOS presents itself. Uh, it's still, uh, as you know, concerning, um, and we certainly involve the hematologists and, and the patients and the families in terms of deciding when to start azithromycin if we feel it's indicated. Um, in terms of what to do if things get worse when you're already on therapy, uh, so we always, like I said, try to control background factors. You'll probably receive a CT scan, make sure that there's nothing else going on, no secondary process. Uh, we'll often recommend bronchoscopy. Uh, people will be susceptible to infections in general uh, post stem cell transplants, so make sure there's, there's no additional uh, treatable issue at play. Um, and then in terms of second-line treatment, uh, extracorporeal photophoresis, um, has been met with a moderate amount of success, um, as has ruxolitinib and abrutinib. Um, so those are all uh, now being approved for lung GVHD.
This is just a list of ongoing studies in case you have interest. Um, supportive care, so if there is significant lung function decline, you may find that um, home oxygen is needed in order to improve your quality of life and improve function. Um, once airways start become very, becoming very inflamed, they can secrete mucus uh, and phlegm. And so people might start to find they have a worse cough with, with production or with phlegm. So some airway clearance mechanisms, so um, devices that help you kind of clear out that phlegm can be very helpful. Pulmonary rehab, which basically means strengthening of your, of, your, of your muscles and strengthening of your system through exercise. And then again, staying mindful of uh, staying safe from infection. Um, at the end of the road, if, if lung transplant, uh, sorry, if, uh, if BOS is progressive and we get to an end-stage lung um, decline, then lung transplant is a possibility. Um, it's, in terms of who is eligible, uh, it depends on the center. Uh, it depends on you know, your country. So I'm Canadian-based, so my restrictions are a little bit different from American restrictions. But in general, it's very important to pick the patient population carefully. And by that, I mean it's, it's ideal if, if it's been at least two years since your transplant, uh, because then your risk of relapse becomes that much lower. Uh, it's, it's ideal if you don't have any other significant DBHD that's causing you a lot of problems, uh, because that will weaken your whole body and make you a more high-risk candidate for surgery, meaning a lung transplant is a, is a big undertaking. So if you don't have that strength going into the surgery, it's very unlikely you'll have a good quality of life coming out of the surgery. Um, and I think what's important to know is that VAS also exists post-lung transplant. So it's actually one of the highest uh, the, 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 the highest incidences of complications that we see post-lung transplant is another form of BOS. So you're sort of condemned to, to always be afraid of this BOS entity, even if you go on to get a lung transplant. And we do find that when transplants fail, the vast majority of, of patients who get a transplant, it will be from, from BOS or allograft dysfunction. So it's, it's I mean, it's certainly an option, but it does have to be carefully weighed in terms of its uh, pros and cons. In terms of is it a good is it a good option for you as as a person? As always, living with um, you know going through your transplant and things that happen after your transplant is a team effort uh, between yourself uh, and your care providers. So. Um, working with the hematologist and the pulmonologist and other subspecialists uh, just to, to optimize your health in all other ways and then to treat these problems as they come up is integral to good post-transplant care. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a pleasure being able to provide this talk today. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Turner. That was an excellent and very comprehensive presentation, which I'm sure we all learned a lot from. Um, we'll now take some questions. And again, if you have a question, type it into the chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. We do have quite a few, so we'll try to get through them as quickly as we can. First question is, a new finding on a PET scan, CT scan, showed, showed mild pulmonary hypertension. This was never noted in prior scans. I'm pretty active. I walk three to four miles daily and do aerobics and strength training. I have no symptoms. I read that pulmonary hypertension is associated with hematopoietic stem cell transplants. I was assured this was nothing, but can you discuss how this occurs after transplant? Is it from GVHD? I'm on tacrolimus for mild GVHD, oral and ocular. Should I keep exercising? Thank you for the question. Uh, excellent question. So a lot of things uh, in the GVHD uh, world, uh, especially when it comes to, to lungs and vessels, aren't well understood. It's not thought to be a definitive, it's not part of a GVHD diagnosis, so we don't call um, post-transplant pH GVHD, but it's probably involved in the pathology somewhere in that the cytokines that are released or the molecular markers that signal in our body cause what we call endothelial dysfunction. So the inner lining of our blood vessels is called the endothelium. Um, and if that gets remodeled, it's basically a similar thing that can happen to the airways. It can remodel and it becomes thick and it becomes tight. 
And as soon as you, you close the lumen of that blood vessel, the pressure goes up. So that's why it's called hypertension, because that pressure in that blood vessel goes up. So it's not GVHD. It's not thought to be GVHD. But that, that immune dysfunction, that kind of dysregulation of your immune system that comes along with GVHD may well have something to do with in terms of how that, that blood vessel remodels itself and ultimately leads to, to higher blood pressures inside the lung. All right, next question. I'm two years post allo transplant. I've had near pneumonia episodes since my transplant, one at, 11, or one at 12 months and one at 18 months. Will I be more prone to pneumonia in the future? Um, it is thought that past episodes of pneumonia can lead to uh, future episodes of pneumonia, mostly because those airways get a little bit scarred. And once airways get scarred, it's, it's more difficult for them to clear out properly. And if you get a little bit of mucus and phlegm in there, it's just a sitting duck to, to generate infection. Uh, but it's, it's not always the case. If, you, if they were small pneumonias that you recovered from, especially post-transplant when your immune system is still getting back on its feet, um, I wouldn't say it sets you up definitively for more pneumonias, but it could be considered a risk factor. All right, and this question comes from a myeloma survivor. I find that about two to three days following my treatment infusions that I feel breathless, poorly supported breathing and speaking. Is this a common event? Currently, I receive DARA and DEX in the infusion and oral pomalist. This also occurred with previous treatment modalities. Um, it's, so drug reactions uh, post-chemo are, uh, as you know, very common. Um, pneumonitis or drug or lung inflammation from chemo is, is certainly possible. Um, if they're resolving on their own um, and you don't have any uh, changes on x-ray uh, and you don't, you're not hypoxic and your oxygen levels are okay, then it's less likely. But I would certainly let your, your cancer provider know, uh, and, and perhaps you can get some lung testing done to make sure there's no lung involvement. All right, next question. Are pulmonary function tests routine after you discontinue immunosuppressants after transplant? When should pulmonary function tests be monitored after transplant? If you wait for symptoms to appear, is it sometimes too late? Uh, so excellent question in three parts. Uh, so. Off the bat, anyone who's getting a transplant should have some degree of pulmonary function test monitoring. Um, it will vary from center to center in terms of how often it's done. Personally, I will, um, in someone who has known GVHD and they're coming off their immunosuppressants, I will increase the, the frequency of monitoring to make sure I don't miss a drop in FEV1. If you're coming off of your immunosuppressants routinely post-transplant, if you haven't had any GVHD and you're just coming off your routine post-transplant immunosuppressants, then I wouldn't necessarily uh, necessarily increase your screening frequency. It would just be if you already have GVHD and you're coming off your immunosuppressants, then that's sort of considered a high-risk time frame for involvement of other organs. Okay, next question. Is there any treatment for chest wall restriction from sclerotic GVHD. Is this reversible? So uh, what I found in my practice is that the two modalities which seem to have the most um, help with sclerotic skin changes leading to breathlessness are uh, photophoresis as well as rexolitinib. So those will be our go-to agents. Uh, in terms of reversible, um, I have seen some mild improvements in FEV1 or lung function uh, with improvement uh, following GVHD-specific therapies, uh, but it's not definitively a reversible. It, there may be some room for improvement in terms of your lung function, though. Our next question is bronchiostasis post allo transplant, a kind of lung GVHD and or related to BOSC, and have the same possible causes and treatment? Uh, sorry, was that bronchiectasis? Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, bronchiectasis is an airway problem. Uh, so it's dilatation of, of more proximal or slightly bigger airways. It can be a result of BOS. So if we see bronchiectasis on a CAT scan, it does raise our radar for BOS or airway involvement of GVHD of some kind. Um, it can also be from other 
to things. So bronchiectasis, this again, is, is not a specific entity. For instance, if you've had bad infections, either as a child or post-transplant, then that can lead to, to some airway scarring and some bronchiectasis, which basically means scarring and enlargement of the airway. Uh, but it, it can be part of the BOS spectrum. It's just not specific to the BOS spectrum. OK. How do you find the balance between immunosuppressive meds and living with some GVHD cough? Does the GVHD cause permanent damage? I uh, was sorry, was that cough or cough? Cough, C-O-U-G-H. OK. Um, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the question again? How do you find the balance between immunosuppressive meds and living with some GVHD cough? Does the GVHD cause permanent damage? Um, so it depends on the kind of, G if it's lung GVHD you're referring to, um, it, it can cause permanent damage in that the airway form, so BOS, is, is, is irreversible. Um, once, once those airways are destroyed, they're gone. Um, uh, in terms of other etiologies for cough related to GVHD, you know, that's, the list is, is pretty long. Um, so for, for lung-specific GVHD, though, immunosuppressants in and of themselves aren't thought to be, um, especially prednisone over the long term, aren't, aren't particularly helpful in controlling that, that disease. All right, if a lung transplant is being considered, is it better to do it somewhat earlier while the patient is relatively healthier, or is it better to wait until the patient is more compromised? It, it's, better, it's better to wait until that lung function um, drops at least, usually below 20% is when we start thinking about it. Mostly because uh, even though it sounds so tempting to have new lungs, uh, it can't, it's a very difficult procedure to, to live through, um, and it's very complicated. Um, so we try to get as much life as we can, or good quality of life as we can, um, by optimizing your function before transplant, and then once you get to a, a point where your your quality of life is so limited, then we start thinking about transplant, only because, uh, like I said, it's a very difficult process and comes with its own problems. All right, can you compare um, the difference between autologous and allogeneic transplant in terms of how much sustained lung damage they cause long term? Definitely. So in general, allogeneic are much higher risk from a lung transplant perspective, uh, mostly because uh, when you're accepting someone else's cells, uh, immune cells into your system, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for possible GVHD or an, an, an immune-related dysfunction. Whereas when you're receiving your own cells, which is autologous, back into your system, there's, you know, pulmonary GVHD in that context is almost non-existent. You're still at risk for some of the earlier complications, so engraftment syndrome uh, in the engraftment period and some, you know, first 100 days inflammatory type reactions as your body gets those stem cells. But in terms of long-term non-infectious complications, the rate is much lower in the autologous group. All right, I'm two years post-allogeneic transplant and in the hospital, or actually in the hospital, I developed pleural effusion of one liter of fluid that was drained off. My breathing is normal. I use CPAP at night for uh, apnea since transplant, and I have two questions. Why might that have been happened, the pleural effusion she's referring to, and am I more at risk for lung GVHD as a result of that? Uh, so pleural effusions are very uh, nonspecific. They require their own workup uh, to determine why they're there. Sometimes it can be a heart problem. Sometimes it can be a medication problem. Um, it's possible, you know, there is a subset of uh, effusion that's thought to possibly be related to GVHD. Um, it's called serositis, which is when your membranes get inflamed and secrete fluid. Um, but that, that's a very specific diagnosis that requires exclusion of other things. So if, if, if there was an answer for why you had the pleural effusion, then that's great news. Um, if there was never an answer but it never came back, that in and of itself is quite reassuring. Um, in terms of that, if it, if it puts you at risk for BOS down the road, uh, I wouldn't expect so, no, not unless it was thought to be a, a GVHD issue to begin with. 
Next question, is rituxan effective for BAS? Is, sorry, Lex, rituximab? Rituximab, yeah. Um, so there's studies of rituximab in BAS. I think it was actually one of my slides here. Um, not in this one. There are, there, there are some studies in process for rituximab, more so in the uh, earlier uh, complications, so something called idiopathic pneumonia syndrome and uh, alveolar hemorrhage. Um, in, BOS, in BOS specifically, there, there's no evidence as of yet, uh, but I believe there are some studies looking, looking at rituximab. All right, Marla, can you take over with the questions, please? Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, when exercising, is there a limitation in how intensely one should push themselves? Is it, is it risky to get very breathless? Um, exercise is always good. <laughs> so, so it really comes down, uh, exercise as you would if you hadn't had a transplant. You know, don't push yourself until your limit. Um, be moderate, you know, be kind to yourself. Uh, but, but getting out of breath and feeling sweaty and tired, I mean, that's never a bad thing. And I'm sorry, I think I missed that component in the first question in, in the pulmonary hypertension, should you keep exercising? Yes, stay strong, keep exercising, keep moving those lungs. It's the best thing you can really do for, for your lung health in the long term. Okay. Could the, could the total body radiation I received during my transplant have had a detrimental effect on my lung functioning? Uh, if possible. So um, a lot of these risk factors haven't been uh, definitively proven, uh, but there's an association, meaning there's probably some link between um, inflammatory factors. So total body radiation would be a fair amount of inflammation that your body works through in, in, in receiving that, that cytotoxic damage. And it's, it is thought that it, it may put you at increased risk of, of lung pathology down the road because of that kind of baseline inflammation that your body works through, and it may set up, set you up for some, some cascades of inflammatory dysregulation and then subsequent airway fibrosis down the road. It's possible. Thank you. Is post-lung transplant BOS treated the same way as post-stem cell transplant BOS? Uh, excellent question, because that is why uh, that azithromycin trial, uh, well, that's part of what it was grounded on in that, yes, azithromycin is used to treat uh, post-lung transplant BOS. The inhalers um, and the Montelukast, uh, not as much in terms of routine therapy. Everyone might get an inhaler because of airflow obstruction, uh, but, but the azithromycin, certainly. How would COVID-19 affect someone with lung GVHD? Very uh, common question in clinic. So uh, I would treat yourself as anyone else with uh, pulmonary dysfunction in that you would be a, 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 an at-risk population. Um, so if you do have compromised lung function from whatever source, then you should certainly be taking extra measures to keep yourself safe from COVID because you would be at risk of having uh, a worse outcome from the infection. What are your thoughts on hyperoxygenated bottled water? I think it's geared towards elite athletes, but could it help BMT patients that have reduced lung function? Um, to be honest, I can't really comment on that. There's been no studies uh, of hyperoxygenated bottled water. I, I, you know, a lot of that is marketing. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be a, a robust response in terms of GBHD. Okay. Um, how do lungs post BMT and steroids compare to smokers' lungs long term? So um, they're the same in that it's both an obstructive process. So smokers' lung will also get that airway inflammation and that airway um, closure or narrowing, which leads to airflow obstruction. So they're both obstructive processes. It's just that the way that you get there and the immune cells involved are different. So they, they both end up in the same stage and in the same place in that you have a low FEV1 and airflow obstruction, but there are very different pathologies. 
Okay, next question. At what point of FEV1 and or clinical symptoms would you suggest a lung transplant? Do you know the mortality rate for folks with CGBHD who have had lung transplants? Um, so, as I mentioned before, we do try to uh, hold off a lung transplant until FEV1 is below the 20% range uh, for the most part. Um, in terms of outcomes for the BOS population, it's quite a small population that we can study because it's a rare disease and then a lung transplant is uh, not something we can offer to everybody. Um, so, but we, what we do know is that the, many people who will receive um, a lung transplant for, for BOS uh, will die or develop BOS within four years, uh, and very few remain alive and free from BOS at 10 year post lung transplant. Um, it can be a very effective um, method to improve survival, so it improves the number of years that you have. Uh, but again, it has to be in a, in a specific patient population with, with, with promising factors. So are you two years out from your transplant? Do you have um, other GVHG that's limiting your function? Are you on a lot of immunosuppressants or prednisone? All of these things will contribute and influence how well you do post-lung transplant. All right, next question. Can cardio exercise help with BOS and overall lung functioning? Absolutely. So. Um, anything that you do, think of your lungs and your heart as, as, as biceps that you're training. So they're all muscles. Your lungs are supported by your muscles. Your heart is a muscle. So anytime you, 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 you train, especially with cardio training, you're, you're improving the function and efficiency of those muscles, uh, and, and they support your lungs. So if, although your lung isn't a muscle, it's supported by the muscles that surround it. And your heart, you know, with time and exercise, uh, will become um, more efficient and stronger as well. So, so conditioning exercise is, is good for both lung and heart problems, within reason. Okay. If abrutinib, myfortic, serolimus, and jacophy have been used but had to be stopped due to serious side effects, what would be your next choice apart from prednisone for uh, advancing BOS? Uh, so you could, uh, let me just get to the right slide here. So extracorporeal photophoresis you could inquire about. Um, it doesn't actually require uh, you starting a new medication, but it's a processing of, uh, of your blood um, uh, that, that some centers offer. And we have seen uh, some good outcomes from the lung perspective with that treatment. Um, can you use budesonide in a nebulizer instead of an inhaler? Would that be best once or twice a day? So yes, you can use budesonide in a nebulizer. Uh, it's just it, it, you have to get the nebules from your pharmacist. Uh, and I would say it's usually prescribed twice a day. OK. And I think this needs to be our last question. We're getting close uh, to the end. Can you explain what pulse oximetry readings demonstrate? And why can you have decent PO2 but low FEV1? So pulse oximetry, so basically what that's reading is it uses um, light to uh, determine how, you, when your red blood cells hold oxygen, they take on a different shape. And so it determines how much oxygen your blood is carrying. So that number we'd like to see above, usually 94%-ish. Um, in terms of why you can have uh, a normal uh, FEV1, sorry, a normal oxygen, but a low FEV1, it's because that exchange of gas, so your lung tissue is okay. You can still breathe in oxygen and transport the oxygen to your blood, and at rest, your blood is still carrying that oxygen. If it is your airways that are affected, so as soon as you start trying to move and exhale, and you can't get that air to move through your lungs properly, that's when you start getting breathless. But you don't have any problem picking up that oxygen from the air, because your DLCO, or that gas transfer number, is still okay. Thank you, and with that, I think we will need to close the question and answer period.